Good evening, everybody, and welcome back to the virtual space of the Princeton Public Library. I'm Janie Herman, and I'll be your host for tonight. I am the manager of uh, adult public programming here at the Princeton Public Library, and it's my delight to welcome you here for tonight's lecture. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, number one is you can right now you're able to chat with each other, but I will be turning that off once our main talk starts and turn it on again at the end during the Q&A. There is a chance for you to ask questions in the ask a question box. And if you see a question that really interests you, please go ahead and vote it up so that we know which questions um, are most popular to be asked during the question and answer period when I come back on the screen to moderate that. Uh, in addition, um, if you are having any technical difficulties, just uh, for the first 10 minutes, there is uh, Becky Bowers from the Libraries Online. She'll be able to answer your questions right now. If you're having trouble hearing or seeing me, just pop your hand up and she'll be able to give you some tips or advice um, what, what you might possibly be able to try. So tonight is a um, library and labyrinth live stream event. The library loves partnering with Labyrinth Books on for our events. And so for tonight, Adventures in Syntax is available from Labyrinth Books at labyrinthbooks.com for 10% off. And the promo code is Frieden. Um, or you can just uh, go in store or curbside pickup by writing to orders.labyrinth at gmail with a callback number or just call the store and press number three. I had put all that information in the chat and I'll put it in again at the end. Uh, this event tonight is a partnership, not only with Labyrinth Books in the Library, but we also really want to thank the support of the Princeton University Humanities Council and the program in linguistics for their um, generous support and help uh, getting the word out about this program tonight. So now I'm going to, oh, and throughout the evening, uh, as we go on, it's going to be interactive. There's going to be poll questions popping up for you to answer at certain points. So be watching in the um, poll questions and Professor Frieden will be letting you know uh, when there's polls for you to answer. So Dr. Robert Frieden received his PhD from Indiana University and after stints at several prominent institutions including Purdue, MIT and McGill among many others, he joined the faculty at Princeton in 1985. He was a member of the faculty for the Council of the Humanities and a professor of linguistics when he transferred to em emeritus status in 2016 after 32 years on the faculty at Princeton. He is interested in theoretical linguistics with emphasis on the foundations of generative grammar from the perspective of the minimalist program. We are really delighted to have such a distinguished scholar here with us tonight. And so I'm gonna bring him on screen now. Here we go. Um, one. I, I should uh, tell you, I am not gonna be talking about theoretical linguistics tonight or the minimalist program um, or uh, Noam Chomsky or any of that. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Adventures in English Syntax, uh, which for me began in 1960 when I was 15 years old and a, um, a 10th grader in Los Angeles. And I had a uh, English teacher who taught us the elements of sentence structure. So she taught us what a subordinate clause was and that the, those can be finite or infinitival or they can be gerundive. She told us about relative clauses, about prepositional phrases, and that basically changed my life because it gave me a tool where I could take my uh, inevitably imperfect drafts of things that I wrote for classes and turn them into something that was much clearer and, uh, and uh, obviously better. Um, so that's where this started, and uh, to, I'm not going to tell you uh, how I got from, uh, from Hamilton High School in Los Angeles to uh, Princeton. Uh, that's probably, I could probably use the same title for an autobiography, but I have no intention of <laughs> using, uh, of writing such a book. But um, let me tell you, uh, so when I, when I retired in 2016, I thought back about um, what I had learned about English syntax, uh, and you know how it's for me. It's still a lot of fun to to work with, you know, not even on the theoretical side, just on the writing side. And I thought it's really unfortunate that uh, most people, most students um, that I found in in my um, experience, 
don't have the same tools. So I wrote this book, uh, you know, basically for a general public. Um, hopefully uh, there'll be some high school students and there'll be some college students who might pick it up and learn a few things. But what I plan to do tonight is basically go through um, some of the material in the book, not all of it, uh, just to give you a taste of what's there and how it works. So, um, oh, sorry, somebody asked about where's that bridge? Um, and I had prepared this slide and thought, no, I didn't know people don't need to know, they're, they're probably not interested. But it, it is in Germany, the, the bridge is called Geierle, um, and it is uh, uh, 300 feet high, and uh, it's almost a quarter of a mile long. And uh, the website calls it the most beautiful suspension bridge in the world, which I think, you know, from this picture, you get an idea that may well be true. And there are other pictures of it that uh, show you the same thing. So as I said, um, this is going to be about English. It's going to be about English sentence structure. It is not going to be about uh, the kind of technical work that I do in linguistics. Uh, if you're interested in that, uh, you might check out my book, Syntax, Basic Concepts and Applications. Note the subtitle. I'll come back to that. So let's start with... Um, a, a quote from um, Henry Fowler, who some of you may know was the co-author along with his brother of the King's English, which was published in 1906, which was uh, an extremely uh, popular and important commentary on the English language. Fowler went on 20 years later to publish uh, a diction the Dictionary of Modern English Usage, which is a monument of scholarship. Um, and actually, uh, I quote from both books in my book. But he says here, sentence analysis, the taking of a sentence to pieces and determining the exact relation of each piece to the rest has, every, has a very practical value for everyone who would either write without blunders or be sure of a writer's meaning. Okay, and if we move forward over a hundred years, we get the writer Lee Child saying, how can you write or even just read and not be attentive to language and how it's put together? Um, so, the, the book that I've written is, uh, has eight chapters. Each chapter is titled by a phrase or a sentence. Uh, an example that I then discuss in great detail in the chapter. The first chapter is, um, I assume most of you will recognize this, the, um, the title of Dr. Seuss's very famous book, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. So here's our first polling question. When you see one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, how many fish do you visualize? And there are six possible answers. So you might want to take a, a second or two to uh, check off what you first thought of. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move on, and you know, we can come back to the answers later. In fact, what the chapter shows you is that um, all the answers are correct. That is, that, that um, phrase can describe as few as two fish, one red fish and one blue fish. But, of course, it could describe many others. And uh, again, obviously what's going on here is that the word fish is ambiguous between fish singular and fish plural, um, which is again, sort of part of its charm. So Dr. Seuss takes the title and puts it on the first page of, of his book and puts a period after it, turning it into essentially a sentence, which got me to thinking, well, how, how could you punctuate 
this sentence so that it becomes unambiguous. Um, and my best effort came out to this. All right, so uh, first of all, if you turn redfish red and bluefish blue, um, you get, uh, all right, that's the setup. Then if we stick in a colon between the two, then you'll notice that one fish, two fish, that red fish, blue fish has to refer back to one fish, two fish. And so the question is, how does that work? Well, one possibility is that one fish is red and two fish are blue. The other possibility is that one fish is blue and two fish are red. So you still have a bit of ambiguity, but um, not as much as the sentence that without the colors and without the internal punctuation. The second chapter of the book starts out with, uh, this isn't the title, but I say it is in the title, Students and Teachers. And what we have here is a coordinate structure with two conjuncts joined together by the conjunction and. So students is a conjunct and teachers is a conjunct. Students is the left conjunct, teachers is the right conjunct. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we need a little grammatical terminology to talk about syntax, but it's uh, hopefully not too much and not oppressive. We then move to the chapter title, which is Exceptional Students and Teachers. And when you read that, you don't know whether uh, the author, me, intended this to mean uh, uh, just exceptional students and then teachers, or both exceptional students and exceptional teachers. And if you remember what Fowler said about taking a sentence to pieces and then putting them back together, I see how they fit together. On one reading, we have exceptional students. That's the left conjunct. And that's coordinated with teachers. So if you do it in terms of what's called a tree diagram, there will only be one more of these. There are several in the book, but the book only uses them to illustrate how the syntax works. It's much easier to look at, uh, at branches of trees than to try to match um, uh, the brackets. And uh, the book doesn't expect you to either uh, memorize the trees or master uh, the art of uh, drawing trees for other sentences. Um, but so we have exceptional students and teachers. Um, and then we can flip the two conjuncts and we can get teachers and exceptional students. So in fact, if what you meant in the first place was teachers and exceptional students, then the way in which to express it without ambiguity is simply to reverse the conjuncts. Now, in the case of exceptional students and teachers, uh, where they're both exceptional, what you have is a coordinate structure, students and teachers modified by an adjective exceptional, which gives you that tree. So exceptional students and teachers bracketed in that way means exceptional students and exceptional teachers. And since um, you can also express that, you know, uh, in either order. So the coordinate structure could either be students and teachers or teachers and students, uh, exceptional modifying both. Okay, um, I may be going too fast, but, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe raise a, a flag if I am. Uh, Princeton University has an introductory course um, titled Introduction to Language and Linguistics. It's Linguistics 210, and it's been now cross-listed with Cognitive Science, Cognitive Science uh, 205. Um, I taught that course from 1984 uh, uh, till shortly before I retired, uh, on the average of once a semester. And it took me until 2006 to realize one day, first day of class, I wrote the title of the 
course on the board. And then I did a double take and I realized that this title is structurally, it's syntactically ambiguous. And I'd never noticed that before. I would always take it for granted, you know, that's just the title of the course and I knew what it meant. Okay, so if we now try to look at the analysis of this, we say the right conjunct of the coordinate structure is obviously linguistics, could be anything else, but what's the left conjunct? And you'll immediately recognize that there are two possibilities. One possibility is that it's just language. So we have introduction to language and linguistics. Um, in other words, uh, introduction to language and introduction to linguistics. But you wouldn't write the course title like that. On the other hand, the left conjunct could be introduction to language and the right conjunct could, conjunct could be linguistics. And if you do that, then you could turn the thing around and say linguistics and introduction to language, which would be a horrible title for this course. Okay, now, there's a lot more in the chapter uh, about the title because uh, there's a, a question about what's the meaning of language and what's the meaning of linguistics. But let's move on. Let's talk about blunders, okay? Um, as I said, Fowler never says anything about, you know, what he meant by blunders, but I, I'll say something. The ambiguity is a blunder. If you write something that's, a, that's structurally, syntactically ambiguous, you are making a blunder in your writing. So um, the, the course title for the linguistics course, the uh, title of chapter two, Exceptional Students and Teachers, those are both ambiguous, those are both blunders. Okay, next blunder, redundancy. I'm sure that you know many of you have been taught in writing classes, you shouldn't be redundant. Okay, but I'm actually interested in a particular kind of redundancy. Notice that the ambiguity we were talking about was with the word and. It's a very dangerous word. Uh, let me show you why. So take redundancy. Take the coordinate structure dogs and mammals. Now, you know, nobody would write that. And if you wrote it, you would get rid of it in a minute because obviously dogs are mammals. So if you say mammals, you don't need to say dogs. And the only way to say dogs and mammals in the coordinate structure is to say dogs and other mammals, so that dogs are excluded, in a sense, from mammal from the, uh, the set of other mammals. So they're disjoint. So that's fine. So you say, oh, all right. So uh, you showed me that I can make a redundancy mistake with and, but it's very unlikely that I would do so. Well. Here we go, um, a couple of book titles. But Joseph Williams published this book, Style Towards Clarity and Grace in 1991. I used it in a linguistics course that, uh, that I taught to satisfy the writing requirement. Uh, it has a marvelous um, analysis of the structure of paragraphs among other things. Uh, it's a very lovely book. Uh, but notice that you, that style is the, the main topic, and clarity and grace are subtopics under style. Now take a look at the book on the right. This is Benjamin Dreyer's book, uh, recent book, Dreyer's English, which he calls an utterly correct guide to clarity and style. Clarity and style, dogs and mammals. It's the same, it's a redundancy. Clarity is a part of good style, not uh, something that's separate from it. Okay, and now we come back to the question of language and linguistics. Is that redundant? 
Well, you have to answer the question, what is language and what is linguistics? And of course, you might come up with the answer, well, linguistics is the study of language. So when you're saying language and linguistics, are you, is that title really saying language and the study of language? Um, I mean, it would be like uh, having an introductory mathematics course, mathematics and the study of mathematics. Um, so there's something off here. Uh, but it's an interesting question. It, it's easier to answer the question, what is linguistics, than it is to answer the question, what is language? Noam Chomsky wrote in um, lectures he gave in 2013 that uh, that's a question that's been around for 2,500 years, and we still don't have a, a good answer to it. What is language? Um, but the, the chapter does try to address it. So... The next polling question I have for you guys is, is there a redundancy problem with language and linguistics? So you should take a minute and see what you think, what you come up with. Okay, so we move on. Now, the third blunder is vagueness. So what do I mean by vagueness? Well, if you write a sentence that could be rewritten um, more explicitly so that the parts of the sentence come together in a way that, uh, that you don't have in your first formulation, um, then you've got a vagueness problem, okay? Um, well, guess what? The conjunction and introduces, can introduce vagueness. Let me give you an example. Okay, we're going back to Henry Fowler again. Uh, so Henry Fowler's sentence analysis, the taking of a sentence to pieces and determining the exact relation of each piece to the rest. Taking the sentence to pieces and determining, taking and determining. Um, just in terms of the, the two verbs, it's not the, the most felicitous. But let me show you how Fowler could have written a stronger sentence. Taking a, of a sentence to pieces to determine the exact relation of each piece to the rest, because that's what he's doing in taking the sentence to pieces. He wants to... Take, the, take them apart to determine how the exact how, what their exact relation is. Um, well, let's move on. Here is an absolutely lovely sentence that was written by Gore Vidal and is published in 1976. He was writing an essay on the Adams family in the New York Review of Books. And he's talking about uh, the founding fathers who he calls the inventors. So he says, although the inventors were hostile to the idea of democracy and believed profoundly in the sacredness of property and the necessary dignity of those who owned it, they did not like the idea of King, Duke, Marcus, or Earl. Um, there's a lot to talk about there. Notice that there are two coordinations they're actually on different levels. Um, not only that, there is a third coordination at the end of the sentence. That's what's called asyndetic coordination, where you don't use the conjunction. And you only use that uh, to sort of highlight something. It's, it's very stylistic. Um, but notice that we've got um, hostile to the idea of democracy and believe profoundly in the sacredness of property. What's the relation between those two ideas? Well, he's got it as am. But I just made this sentence stronger, and I think I've expressed what uh, 
in fact, Vidal was probably thinking. That is, that the inventors were hostile to the idea of democracy because they believed profoundly in the sacredness of property and the necessary dignity of those who owned it. So there, it's because, it's cause and effect, it's not and. And if you use and and you mean cause and effect, you're being vague. Uh, and I found this in student papers. And I find this in other writers who, uh, I, I mentioned them in the book, but in, uh, in this talk, they will remain uh, unmentioned. Okay, so we are now at um, the fourth chapter of the book, which is titled A Review of a Book by Two Philosophers. And again, if you think about that phrase, it's not even a sentence, but if you think about that phrase, uh, you'll notice that it can have two interpretations. It can, we can either be talking about a book by two philosophers, or we can actually be talking about a review by two philosophers. So how does that work syntactically? Well, if we're talking about a book by two philosophers, then a book by two philosophers is a, uh, pardon the phrase, syntactic unit in the structure of a review of a book by two philosophers. Alternatively, if we're talking about a review by two philosophers, then what we have is a review of a book is a syntactic unit on its own, and by two philosophers joins together with that unit to form another syntactic unit, and in that larger syntactic unit, by two philosophers modifies review, not book. Okay. So, if we have a book by two philosophers, by two philosophers is a prepositional phrase. Again, a little terminology, hopefully nothing too taxing. But we could expand that and say a book written by two philosophers. Okay. Um, all right. Next polling question. Now, this is a question that I would ask my students in the introductory course. Sometimes I um, uh, had up to 60 to 70 students in a course. How many of you know what a relative clause is? So I'm asking you guys, how many of you know what a relative clause is? Um, and let me tell you the answer from uh, the Princeton side. I would be lucky in a class of 60 to 70 students if five students raised their hands and said they knew what a relative clause was and the rest hadn't, okay? Now, I mean, it seems to me that that's something that you ought to know in high school, if not before. Because if you're a writer, you're writing with relative clauses, you're using them. And you really ought to know what it is you're using. So, moving on, we can expand written by two philosophers into a relative clause, which was written by two philosophers, which was written by two philosophers as a relative clause. Next polling question, okay? And this is the follow-up question to my linguistic students. And how many of you who know what a relative clause is know the difference between a restrictive and a non-restrictive relative clause. And let me tell all of you that you all know the difference. You may not recognize it as such, but when I explain it to you, you're going to say, oh yeah, of course. So unconsciously, you know the difference between restrictive and non-restrictive relative clause, but it's extremely useful certainly in writing and also in reading, to be aware of that difference and to know that it might be in play and, and whatever you're writing or reading. So let's go back and take um, Fowler's quote again. Everyone who would either write without blunders or be sure of a writer's meaning. 
who would either write without blunders or be sure of a writer's meaning is another relative clause. They're all over the place. I mean, you're gonna, you, you can't move without tripping over them. Okay, well, I wanna change that slightly. So suppose we talk about every student who would either write without blunders or be sure of a writer's meaning. Okay, and now I wanna show you something. If um, you write it out this way, every student who would either write without blunders or be sure of a writer's meaning, then you're talking about just those students who would either write without blunders or be sure of a writer's meaning. And the implication is there are other students who wouldn't, who don't, who don't care. Whereas if you were to write every student, comma, who would either write without blunders or be sure um, of a writer's meaning, then you, what you have here is a non-restrictive relative clause. And the non-restrictive relative clause then tells you that it applies to every student. So there is no student who wouldn't, okay? Um, yeah, another quick example is suppose you have uh, Martians who live in class houses get sunburned. Well, if we're talking about, if not all Martians live in glass houses, then only those that do get sunburned. And that's what you're saying, Martians who live in glass houses. But if all Martians live in glass houses, then what, you, that, what you've got there is a non-restrictive relative clause. Okay, next. We have, that book was written by two philosophers as a clause. That book is the subject, was written by two philosophers, is the predicate. Subject and predicate make a clause. It's also a passive construction because it was written by, uh, that's the passive by, and versus the corresponding active where the, the logical subject is two philosophers, those are the guys who wrote. So two philosophers wrote that book. Next polling question, how many of you were taught or told not to use the passive voice in writing? Okay. Fortunately, I wasn't, but I know that there are many people out there who were, and I know that there are a number of high school students at Princeton High School who were. Um, okay, um, I guess let me make one other um, comment. The, the criticism of the passive voice is a 20th century phenomenon. I, I did a little research on the history and I couldn't find anybody bad mouthing the passive voice before the 20th century. Um, and the, the, about the, the first two references I found were um, the Fowlers in their the King's English, where they were talking about awkward passives. Um, all of these examples, all of this stuff is discussed in the book. Um, and there was an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin, an English professor named Edwin Woolley, who wrote a handbook in which he talked about bad passives. Now, you have to wait until about, I think it's 1918, before William Strunk, the author of, L of Strunk and White, first author of Strunk and White, to uh, actually declare something like, use the active voice. Didn't say don't use the passive voice, just said use the active voice and said it's more, it's stronger, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we have, we have to wait until uh, about 1946 for George Orwell in his wonderful essay, uh, in, um, Politics in the English Language, where at the end of the essay, he puts down a rule, never use the passive voice when you can use the active. Of course, he didn't follow it himself in the essay. Um, and so, uh, you, know, you know, you might uh, sort of take it with a grain of salt. 
Well, what's interesting I found is that every criticism of the passive voice where they're actually giving you examples of bad passives, those sentences are bad for other reasons. So as far as I can tell, there is no reason not to use the passive voice, and in fact, very good reason to, which I discuss in the book. Um, we're now on to the sixth chapter. Um, this is the first sentence of Pride and Prejudice. This may be um, possibly the greatest single sentence in the English language. Uh, and, you know, I discuss it at length, not too long, actually. There's about 12 pages worth of chapter discussing this sentence. But what I want to show you about the sentence is, take a look at the syntax. What we have is, it is a truth universally acknowledged, and what follows is a subordinate clause that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Well, Jane Austen could have equally written that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife as a truth universally acknowledged. And I, I think you can see immediately that it doesn't sound, it doesn't have the same ring. There's something wrong with it. Okay? Now, let's move on. We have universally acknowledged. Well, Jane Austen could have written acknowledged universally. So we have another two variants. And if you multiply the variants, we now have four sentences. Three sentences that Jane Austen didn't write and one sentence that she did. Okay, well, let's go on to one more. Notice that universally acknowledged can be expanded as a relative clause. So it is a truth which is universally acknowledged or that is universally acknowledged. Well, multiplying all these together, we wind up with 12 variants, okay? Um, so here's the next question. How many other ways could Jane Austen have rephrased that first sentence? That chapter actually tries to give an answer. It's not a definitive answer, as I'll explain in a minute. But uh, why don't you take a wild guess as to what the answer might be? What's the closest answer of these? And now I'm going to give you my answer. Okay. And uh, I'll also admit to you that every time I see that number, I mean, it actually it's uh, 768. But um, these are the variants that she could have written that she didn't write. Furthermore, oh, I'm sorry, I should have told you that if you, um, yeah, I, I, I blew this. Um, you should have also been thinking about how instead of universally acknowledged, universally accepted, uh, generally accepted, if you change the words, you get a lot more possibilities. So it's not just the syntax. I and mean, you can get quite a bit uh, of variation by just changing the syntax slightly. But if you change the, you know, the word choices also give you much more. And I came up with this number and like I say, I still have, trouble believing it, even though I calculated it several times. All right. Chapter seven. Does every politician who cheats instinctively lie? <clears throat> well, notice here again, we've got a relative clause. Who cheats? Or who cheats instinctively? And the question is, this is ambiguous. There's no and, but it's ambiguous. So is it instinctively cheats or lie instinctively? All right, well, the chapter goes through, again, a lot of uh, some of the, the, the syntax of adverbs and the syntax of questions, um, uh, and I won't say anything more about it. Um, chapter five uh, is Bob is Certain to Succeed, uh, is the title, 
Notice that to succeed, which I now have in blue, is an infinitival construction. It's actually an infinitival clause with a missing subject. Or to put it another way, the subject, the missing subject is Bob, but Bob has wound up as the subject of the main of the, the full clause, the root clause. Well, now consider uh, these three sentences. Bob is certain to succeed. That Bob will succeed is certain, and Bob is certain that he will succeed. And I think you can see pretty much immediately that Bob is certain to succeed is essentially synonymous with that Bob will succeed is certain and is not synonymous with Bob is certain that he will succeed. Because it could be the case that Bob is certain to succeed and not be the case that Bob is certain that he will succeed. Okay, well, lots, lots more fun stuff in that chapter. And we get finally to the last chapter. Um, this again goes back to Fowler. This is an example that he gives in a, an article titled Passive Disturbances in his Dictionary of Modern English Usage. And he says there's something wrong with this. So inferior defenses could then as now be tackled as Vernon did at Portobello, Exmouth at Algiers, Seymour at Alexandria. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody recognizes this, but these are all great British naval battles. Um, if you, I did a Google search and the only hit I got for this sentence was, guess what, Fowler's Dictionary. I, so I have no idea where he got it from um, and what its context was. And I really wish I knew. Okay. Seventh polling question. Do you agree with Fowler that there is something wrong with the sentence? You may not, but I'm, I'm curious. Okay. Now, what happens if we take that sentence and instead of did, we insert had? So inferior defense, defenses could then as now be tackled as Vernon had at Portobello, Exmouth at Algiers, and Seymour at Alexandria. It, it seems to me, and it seems to a number of people I've talked to, that that sentence is much better. In fact, it's pretty darn good compared to the sentence we did. Let me show you just a, a little bit about why that might be the case. The, the book actually talks about this. It talks about Fowler's analysis, and then it proposes a different analysis of Fowler's example. And uh, I want to show you something about this. So um, before we do, does changing did to had improve how the sentence sounds? To you. Okay. So notice that what we've really got there is we've got what's called ellipsis. We've deleted parts. That is, we could expand that sentence. Inferior defenses could then as now be tackled as Vernon had tackled them at Portobello, Exmouth had tackled them at Algiers, and Seymour had tackled them at Alexandria. Okay, and what happens with the Fowler sentence is that had, had tackled them after Vernon had, we get, we get Vernon had, but we can go on and we can eliminate um, Whoops, yeah, we can, we can eliminate even the had for Xmouth and Seymour. So all we wind up with is Xmouth and the prepositional phrase at Alexandria, I mean, at, at Algiers and Seymour at Alexandria. So it looks like there's actually two processes of ellipsis going on and they're interacting. And actually it's fascinating how that works. And I mean, that's what I discovered in the chapter, uh, which was part of the adventure in writing it. 
So um, at the end of this talk, I have a conclusion, which I hope you might begin to see the sense of that the sentence structure of English actually at any language is endlessly fascinating when you're paying attention. And I have a hope that reading this book will equip you for your own adventures with the sentences that you write and read. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you. Um, I'm going to join you back on screen here. And we're going to go to the question and answer portion of the night. And um, what a fascinating talk. And thank you everybody for taking part in the polls. Um, and you, the polls are still open if you want to take part. And I'm going to also put the chat back on so that everybody wants to chat with each other, they can. Um, I'm having problems on my end entering the chat. Usually I'm out there chatting with you. Um, so we have a few questions here and you can still put the questions into the ask a question box if you want. Uh, the most popular question for you, Bob, was how did you get interested in English syntax? What crack opened the door giving a glimpse into this fascinating world? Well, sorry, I took my uh -oh. uh, earphones out. Ah. Okay, got it. Uh, thank you again, whoever made that suggestion that, that saved the day. Um, well, as I said, I got interested because my 10th grade English teacher uh, taught me something about syntax. Uh, and then my own personal history, uh, I went to Berkeley uh, as an undergraduate and I, uh, I majored in English. And then I went to graduate school at Indiana University, majoring, I mean, you know, in uh, uh, still in English. And the, um, the second semester of my graduate career, I had a course that was titled The Growth and Development of the English Language, and it was from Middle English to Modern English. And my professor <clears throat> put a, a phrase structure tree at the end of the course. He, he just he put an example with a phrase structure tree on the board, and he mentioned syntactic structures which is Noam Chomsky's um, first monograph, a uh, revolutionary book in linguistics. And it's you know, about 112 pages. <clears throat> and I had, uh, I guess it was an epiphany. I said, oh my gosh, you can do this stuff formally. I don't know, what, I just, it just struck me. So that summer I read syntactic structures and then uh, from then on it was, uh, <laughs> it was full steam ahead. I just, uh, I, I mean, I dropped the literature and uh, started focusing on linguistics. So would you say um, that Noam Chomsky then was one of the biggest influences in your career? I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, would you say that Noam Chomsky was one of the biggest influences in your career? Yeah, well, uh, right, big influence, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that's awesome. Okay. So another question is, um, did you ever tell that teacher at Hamilton High School that she changed your life? Um, I had a conversation with her when she was uh, uh, 90. Oh. And yeah. I did, Yeah. Uh, when I was visiting in Los Angeles, and uh, you know, I did tell her that I'd become a linguist, and I did thank her for, yeah. Okay, so this question is very specific. Let me see if I can, and I don't know if you want to pull up the question itself um, on your screen, because it might need to be looked at. Um, you, you can't pull up the questions, you know. Um, so how could you make this unambiguous, the person uh, Andrea wants to know my friend my friend Sheldon and I went so that you would know whether there are a total of three people an unmarried friend and Sheldon and I or two people a friend named Sheldon and I <laughs> well that's brilliant that's brilliant <laughs> okay. okay um I, I think if you're using commas, you're you're stuck. Um, uh, 
actually, here's another possibility. Put both in front of my friend. So if you say both my friend Sheldon and I went, and in fact, if you remove the commas, then I think what happens is both will will bracket my friend Shen Sheldon. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that was a very specific question. Um, we already answered the question about the bridge. So I don't see any, oh, here's one that just came in. What do you think the relationship is between writing and thinking? This was asked by Adam Alga. He wants to know the relationship between <laughs> writing and thinking. Uh, leave it to a philo philosopher. Um, I, I think, it, it, it's a very interesting question because we don't really know what a thought is. Um, I mean, we don't have a formal theory of thought. Uh, you know, you say you put your thoughts in writing, but when you write something down in paper, you know, it, it, when, when you create the sentence in your mind, it's in this very rich stew of what you know, what you believe, how you reason, uh, how you're feeling, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. And when you put it, when you externalize it in black and white, it loses all of that. That's no longer there. And it only gains that, that rich cognitive meaning when some other human being takes it into their mind. Uh, and so, um, you know, I... So I, you know, I think that there's a, a tenuous relation. I also think that um, in terms of writing, that writing helps you to think because I often find that when I write something down and I go back over it and I try to look at it as if, you know, I, I, I'm not thinking about what, what I was thinking about and trying to say, does this sentence say what I, you know, exactly what I was thinking about? Um, you sometimes notice that you, you skip steps that you make uh, assumptions. Sometimes they're untenable assumptions. Uh, so it's it, it helps you to clarify your thinking. So I think you know writing and thinking uh, you know are not completely independent activities. Okay. And I think we have one final question here, um, and this is from Lydia Frank, wanting to know in the sentence that we were discussing. This, uh, this sentence on interior defense that we were discussing yeah. had better than did in part because of the word then. Like, is it the word that makes it better? Um, no, I, I think what's, what's going on here is that um, you have word tackle. So you have a passive past participle. And with had, you have had tackled, and that is a perfective participle. Right. And they're phonetically the same. So it sort of looks like the ellipsis is keying in on the phonetic similarity, whereas when you had did, um, or for that matter, if you take did not to be, Fowler takes did to be a main verb, but you could take did to be the auxiliary do. And if you do, then, um, you know, then it would be as, as Vernon um, did tackle them. And then you've got tackle versus tackled, and they're not identical. And when you do the ellipsis, it's not the same. Right. So I think there's something there. Okay. Um, so this has been a really interesting, um, this is the first time we've had so many um, polls being a part of the presentation, which has yeah. been really great. And, um, you know, I think really fascinating for everybody to have that uh, happen. So thank you for that. And so many great examples in your slide. And again, um, I want to thank our partners um, at the university in the department of, uh, in the program in logistics and in um, 
the Humanities Council for their support, and again, our great partners at Labyrinth Books, whom we, we do with all of our events. And I put a reminder up that you can get a 10% discount if you want to read more about this topic of adventures in syntax. Uh, Labyrinth is our local bookseller, and we all want to support local independent bookstores and keep them going because a town needs both a library and a bookstore, in our opinion. Uh, we have actually some other great events coming up this week here on Crowdcast. Uh, for instance, tomorrow is National Voter Registration Day, and we have the League of Women Voters coming on uh, for that, and they have a whole series of events. And then uh, at the end of the week, we actually have Maria Hinojosa coming on to discuss her new memoir with two Princeton faculty members. You can see that in our event listing. Um, so you might just want to go and check out what else we have happening here on Crowdcast and also go check out the Labyrinth has a Crowdcast page as well. So uh, the fall season has started and we're here to provide you with lots of entertainment in the virtual manner um, during these times. We can't wait till we can welcome you back into our community room and into the store and meet again in person. Um, but in the meantime, we're trying to be as interactive and as possible. And Professor Frieden, you just did a great job tonight of making sure that people could be engaged and interacting. And um, thank you so much for the great job. Well, thank and you again. That, we are exactly at about the one hour mark as planned. So perfect. So thank you again, everybody. I'm signing off here for tonight and we'll see you all next time.